This is part one of a series on neonatal pharmacology. This section will focus primarily on pharmacokinetics. To be clear, these sessions are intended for residents who will occasionally take care of children, especially neonates. The sessions are not aimed at a level for those who are or wish to be pediatric anesthesiologists. One final caveat, the lecture series is on neonatal pharmacology. I do not address issues for older patients. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. How many times have you heard the phrase, children are not small adults? Clearly, that statement applies more to neonates than to any other group of pediatric patients. No matter what anyone says, from a pharmacologic perspective, a normal 12-year-old is probably essentially indistinguishable from a normal 25-year-old. You are undoubtedly familiar with the concept of orphan drugs, that is, those which are used in the treatment of a rare disease. One of the problems with orphan drugs is that their utilization is so low that it will be difficult to meet normal FDA standards regarding testing. In addition, because the diseases are uncommon, there won't be many sales. Children have been described as therapeutic orphans. Unlike the problem with obtaining data on orphan drugs because the infrequency of the condition they are designed to treat, the problem with obtaining data for drugs in pediatric patients is obviously not an inadequate number of potential subjects to participate in the study. The problem is that the constraints placed on using pediatric patients in a study are so restrictive that it's all but impossible to complete a study. Think about it from the perspective of the amount of blood necessary for the determination of a serum drug level. And then realize that in order to complete a pharmacokinetic study, that sample would have to be obtained several times during a day. The end result is that a large percentage of drugs have never been tested in children, and the drug labels often contain a specific disclaimer regarding use in pediatric patients. Furthermore, those drugs which have been tested in children commonly have not been tested on, in children under two years of age. The end result is that many of the drugs used in children every day represent off-label use. Before 2002, there was no requirement that drugs be tested on children, even if the anticipation was that the, that the drug would be useful in that patient population. As a result, prior to that time, only about 20% of drugs were approved by the FDA for use in children. When administered to a child, the other 80% of drugs constituted off-label use. There are several reasons why drugs were rarely tested in children. One factor is the economic considerations. Children represent a small portion of the market for most drugs. As previously mentioned, a second factor is the difficulty in performing studies. First, study techniques appropriate for adults may be challenging in children. Blood sampling, for example, while routine in an adult, is traumatic for a child. Second is the issue of informed consent. While parents can give uncontested consent for a child up to the age of seven years, Older children must give assent, that is, they must agree to participate in the study. How many seven-year-olds will agree to have blood samples obtained repeatedly over the course of a study? Although the situation has improved over time because the FDA can now require testing in children, they still receive a large number of drugs which have never been studied in that patient population. As a consequence, it is common that the adult dose of a drug is simply adjusted downward based on the weight of a child. Arguably, one of the most dramatic examples of when this process failed miserably was in gray baby syndrome due to chloramphenicol. Gray baby syndrome is a potentially fatal complication in neonates attributed to a combination of immature metabolism by the neonatal liver and compromised excretion by the neonatal kidney. Although more drugs are being tested in children, there are still a large number for which dosing only occurs on an adjustment based on weight and an understanding of the metabolism and excretion in that population. By definition, a neonate is 28 days of age or less. One problem is that this is not a very homogeneous group. Contrast a 28-week preemie who weighs less than a pound with a term infant of a diabetic mother 
who can easily weigh 10 pounds or more. In fact, there is probably more disparity within the neonatal population than between any other two groups of children. When considering neonatal pharmacology, another factor is the definition of the patient's age. The easiest definition is chronologic age or postnatal age, that is, the interval since birth. Postconceptual age and postmenstrual age both attempt to take into consideration the interval of gestation prior to birth. Finally, there is adjusted age or corrected age. This term adjusts age based on the difference between delivery date and due date. Now it's time to talk about pharmacokinetics, the primary subject of this presentation. I'm not going to spend any time talking about absorption. I can't remember the last time I gave a drug to an innate by any route other than intravenous or inhalation. This slide does, however, present a list of some factors that influence absorption. Pause the presentation here if you want to review them in more detail. Multiple factors contribute to differences in distribution between children, especially neonates, and adults. One of the most significant factors influencing the distribution of drugs is total body water. Note that at birth, a term neonate has a total body water of approximately 80% of weight. This is increased in preterm neonates. As a result, the volume of distribution for water-soluble drugs is increased in term neonates and even more in preemies. Accordingly, the loading dose of water-soluble drugs, neuromuscular blocking agents, for example, is increased in neonates. Also note that the extracellular flu fluid volume exceeds the intracellular volume in neonates. Although not illustrated in this slide, the volume of cerebrospinal fluid is also increased ne in neonates, resulting in the need for an increased dose in terms of milligrams per kilogram for local anesthetics administered into the subarachnoid space. Body fat also changes. In a 1.5 kilogram premature neonate, fat is only 3% of body weight. This compares with 12% in term neonates. Muscle mass is also decreased. As a consequence, drugs such as propofol, which rely on redistribution to fat and muscle, will have a higher plasma concentration and a prolonged half-life. As evidenced by these graphs, even normal term neonates have reduced albumin and total protein concentrations compared to adults. In addition, not only the quantity, but also the quality of protein binding may re be reduced in neonates. This occurs for several reasons. First, at birth, the affinity of albumin for acidic drugs is reduced and increases over the first several months of life. Second, the levels of alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, which binds basic drugs, is half that of adult values. As a result of these differences, decreased protein binding leads to a higher concentration of free drugs. This obviously results in a greater effect in those drugs which are highly protein-bound. One additional factor to take into consideration is the presence of bilirubinemia, which occupies some of the sites that would normally be occupied by drugs. Finally, the blood-brain barrier of a neonate is more permeable than that of an adult. This illustration demonstrates that the endothelium in the cerebral vasculature of the neonate does not provide the tight barrier present in the adult population. In addition, the adult vessel is surrounded by tightly packed astrocyte end feet, while gaps are prominent in neonates. These two anatomic factors combine to result in increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier in neonates. One indication of this is their poten potential to develop kernicterus. Neonates, especially premature neonates, are prone to develop, develop hyperbilirubinemia. Because of the decreased levels of albumin, a greater percentage of bilirubin exists in the unconjugated state. Unconjugated bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier of neonates, 
resulting in kernicterus, which is essentially bilirubin encephalopathy with basal ganglion toxicity. The increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier also has ramifications for drugs. Now it's time to consider differences in drug elimination. I'm sure you remember that enzymes that metabolize drugs are generally grouped into phase one or phase two enzymes. Cytochrome P450 enzymes, which are responsible for oxidation, reduction, or hydrolysis, are classified as phase one enzymes. After phase one metabolism, the metabolite can be excreted or conjugated prior to excretion. First, all discussions of age on this slide are considering adjusted age. The cytochrome enzymes are not homogeneous in their levels at birth or their rate of maturation. CYP1A2, which metabolizes ropivacaine, is absent in the neonate and does not reach adult levels until four to six months of age. CYP2C9, which metabolizes ketamine, rapidly increases after birth and is neuro normal adult values by two weeks of age. CYP2D6, which metabolizes codeine, has only 20% of adult activity by one month of age. CYP3A4, which metabolizes midazolam and levobupivacaine, also has very low levels at birth and does not begin to approximate normal adult values until three months of age. Phase two metabolism involves taking either the primary drug or its metabolite and converting it to a water-soluble compound for renal excretion. Multiple enzymes are involved in this process, and there are numerous isoforms of each enzyme with a maturation pattern varying for each. Interestingly, the time course for maturation of these enzyme systems tends to parallel the maturation of glomerular filtration rate. Pause this slide to review the information presented in the table. This graph shows GFR as a function of maturation. Note that at birth, GFR is about one-third of normal adult values. It increases over time as a result of decreased renal vascular resistance and an increase in renal blood flow, in addition to increased surface area of the glomerular membrane. Even at one year of age, GFR is only about 90% of adult values. This graph shows the clearance of different drugs as a function of maturation. Note that age is expressed as postmenstrual age. Accordingly, a one-year-old born at term would show us 92 weeks on this graph. Notice that the shape of the curves and the general clearances for most drugs are closely related to the maturation of glomerular filtration rate. Multiple drugs, most notably remifentanil, shown here, and succinylcholine, undergo extrahepatic metabolism. When expressed as milligrams per kilogram, most of these drugs have more rapid clearance in young children than in adults. Finally, there is pulmonary elimination. The same factors which influence anesthetic uptake affect elimination of volatile anesthetic agents. Because there is less uptake of the agent by the muscle and fat groups, elimination is faster in neonates than in adults. In summary, the volume of distribution for water-soluble drugs is increased in neonates compared to adults. Increased free fraction of most drugs occurs as a result of decreases in the amount of proteins, their ability to bind the drugs, and potentially increased levels of bilirubin which compete for binding sites. The levels of most enzymes important in drug metabolism are decreased at birth. The rate at which they achieve adult values is highly variable. 
GFR is about one-third of the normal adult value in a term newborn and even lower in a preemie. As a result, excretion of drugs and metabolites is reduced. Finally, and most importantly, to paraphrase a statement at the beginning of this presentation, preemies are not simply small newborns. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. I hope you found it helpful.